everybody. Welcome to the Talking Animation Podcast. And this is the show where we look at underrated, obscure uh, films that we think deserve more love, animated films. And today we are talking about uh, Kubo and the Two Strings from Laika. And this can be super fun. I'm film critic Rachel Wagner and Stanford is here. Hey, how's it going? I'm doing great. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. So excited to talk about this movie. This is really one of my favorite films from Laika. I mean, I don't know yeah. there's just a ton of movies from Laika, but this is definitely high on my list of films mm-hmm. from that studio. Yeah, I agree. I I hadn't seen it since it came out, so it was I was curious to see how it would hold up. Yeah, I likewise. I, mm-hmm. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it since 2016. I mean, my favorite will always be Coraline. I love that film, but uh, but That's this a good one, one. Yep. is also, I think, really strong. And uh, it's a studio that is just consistently putting out quality animated films and keeping kind of stop motion uh, art form alive, which, yeah. of course, I love to see. Me too. Yeah. So it came out in 2016, which was a really strong year for animation. Oh my you goodness. had Zootopia, Zootopia Moana, Moana, uh, and uh, I'm trying to remember what else, but it was a a pretty strong year. And uh, unfortunately, Kubo and Stu Strings underperformed at the box office. And I'm curious what you think why do you think that stop motion films why they continue to struggle to connect with audiences you know that's a really good point and i honestly i don't know i just wonder if if the general public you know maybe not necessarily animation fan you know true animation fans like ourselves the more maybe the more casual movie goer Mm-hmm. Are turned off by the by by you know that particular art form are the are the stories mm-hmm. not necessarily appealing? I wondered about that too because the stories are often kind mm-hmm. of high concept. Yeah, you know because I mean the year before you had Shaun the Sheep movie and Shaun the Sheep movie is so endearing and sweet and delightful and I feel like Shaun the Sheep movie has everything that the Minions has as far as the type of characters they they don't talk there's you know the kind of that silent movie kind of comedy yeah. type of style the animation's very sweet in they I don't know and yet it bombed at the box office Shaun the sheep movie here luckily it did well in europe but uh i I just think have we conditioned kids to only like or accept computer graphics computer yeah cg animation at this point you bring up a very excellent point (laughs) and it's too bad because it's it's such a it's such a great art form and so many of these films are very good, you know. Mm-hmm. Kubo, I, I, I wonder how well it would do with like a family audience because, yeah, it's not. I mean, even though, I mean, it's almost it has the appearance of it, but it's almost not like a kids' film. It's pretty. It's given that it's kind. It's kind. I mean, it, it, the. the thematically it's it's heavy i think and and that's not saying it as a criticism i'm just saying just you know Mm -hmm. and also it's i think kind of i mean there's it's scary yeah uh, yeah and it was also released in august which i think was a mistake yeah and that uh, that i think that's when people are going back to school and exactly not as invested in that year for the animated film, they had uh, Zootopia, Kubo and the Two Strings, Moana, My Life as a Zucchini, and The Red Turtle. Mm-hmm. So that was an interesting group of nominees. Yeah, um, and then also you know Finding Dory mm-hmm. was released was released that year. Sing, yeah, Trolls, and then you know Your Name. Hello, yeah. I mean you know. <laughs> Top of the list, right? Yeah, I but, so wish that they had waited to for the 
for the Oscar release, they had waited for your name for 2017. Yeah. Because I think it would have had a, a better chance. Uh, I mean, I would just like to think that it would beat the boss baby or Ferdinand. <laughs> oh, hello. I mean, really? I and then also, I mean, not that this was uh, the secret life of pets. It came out, you know, just an, another mm, one of those. Yeah. True. And then not wanting to be, to be crass, but sausage party. Too. It looks like you know, in 2016. <laughs> so, yeah, talk about I, you know, not a not a film for families. But. I do worry though that we have kind of conditioned kids away from other animation besides CG. Besides but, CG, yeah, mm-hmm. I, and, and and partly also the parents. I think that they that they have been sort of trained too to to say, okay, CG, that's for kids. Let's go. It seems like the, yeah, I agree with you. It seems like the only CG, excuse me, stop motion anim, animation film that's really done well over the last 30 years has been The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. And, I mean, that's one way back. That's, that's an oldie but goodie now. But it, I don't remember, I don't, I'm not sure that it was a huge hit when it first came out. I don't mm-hmm. remember, but I don't think it was. I think it, it like gained its audience from like home video, you know. Yeah, I think didn't did Coraline not do pretty well? I don't remember Coraline being yeah, a smash hit in the you know mm-hmm. in you know in, in its first theatrical run. More of a cult, but fan. it seemed like yeah, like it kind of kind of a cult following. Mm-hmm. Again, that's a very uneducated <laughs> you know, <laughs> of observation. I don't because I don't really One, I don't really know, but it seems like it. Yeah, one interesting thing about this movie is that it was nominated for Best Visual Effects by the Academy, which yeah. is only the second time an animated film has been nominated for Best Visual Effects, which the first time was Nightmare. So it's kind of interesting. And and, and they're stunning in this movie, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. The special effects are, are yeah, definitely and a worthy nomination. It lost to The Jungle Book. Oh. Which, <laughs> I mean, it, it has impressive visual effects if all you're looking for is realism. Yeah. I mean, every single thing in the whole shot when you see it is is created as a visual effect. So it's it, it's kind of hard to to ignore that. But in this case, you have everything that's created is also a visual effect, and it's also creating a whole new world. It's not worried about realism. Well, exactly. And then also there's so much, I just feel like so much of those big, especially those big kind of splashy scenes in the, in this film. I mean, even just the ones though with the, just that had the puppets in it. Mm -hmm. It's impressive. Oh yeah. I think. Yeah. It's very impressive. You think that, oh, they, they CGI'd that. And then you realize, oh no, that, that was a, that was an actual puppet. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Laika is an interesting, we can talk a little bit about sort of the background of Laika. I don't think we've done, I guess we did Paranorman a long time ago. It was a long time ago, wasn't yeah. it? H? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Laika is an interesting thing. I mean, it, in a way, it's kind of a poster child for nepotism. <laughs> because I think that if it didn't have Travis Knight and Phil, Phil Knight, Who's the owner? One of the owners of Nike behind it. It would not have made it through all these flops. Basically, they've had one. After yeah, another, they've had but... you know deep pockets <laughs> that are funding this studio. That yeah, that hasn't had just like a huge hit, you know. Mm-hmm. But they keep you know they keep creating, and good for them. Yeah. But and originally. Originally, Phil Knight became involved because he was an investor in Will Vinton's studio that he yes, had. Yes, that's right. And if you want to check out a pretty interesting documentary, last year at, uh, I think, South by South, South by Southwest, uh, one of the festivals uh, is called Clay Dream, and it's all about Will Vinton. And hey, have kind you of, seen that, Rachel? Uh, yeah, 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 I saw it. Oh, uh, Okay. One of the I want to see that. 
What yeah, did you think it was, of it? It was really interesting. And it definitely, it. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily portray Phil Knight in like the best, <laughs> the best <laughs> light. Uh, what he did as far as with Will Vinton and uh, kind of usurping the studio uh, away from uh, what away from Will Vinton. But uh, I'm sure there's two sides to that coin. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Are you a fan of Rachel's reviews? Do you look forward to family movie night, female film critics panels, or the talking Disney podcast? If so, please consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron. As a patron, you get to access monthly events such as the watch alongs and Q and A's where you get to talk to stars and find out the behind the scenes of the movie making industry. And you can pick what I review for family movie night, or even become a guest on the podcast Podcasts and YouTube channels are expensive and I really, really could use your help. I would so appreciate it. You also get to be a member of the Facebook group where we talk about all the films that we're seeing and we have so much fun. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies and select one of the Rachel's fan tiers. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. You know, Travis Knight, he was an animator for all the projects that they worked on. He started out as a rapper, which is kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> and uh and then he he became an animator and he uh is the director of this film and uh i found out today as i was talking with some of my friends that i guess his direction is a little bit there's a little bit of scandal yeah. kind of associated with it see and that stuff that you shared with me today has changed my perspective i kind of like i'm a little for the worse about <laughs> this film overall you know yeah i mean it's hard what how do you usually kind of go about that when you when you're looking at because you have you try to separate the art from the artist yeah yeah but when you kind of learn behind the scenes details i mean in fairness so this this creator shannon tyndall he uh in uh when they were having all of these layoffs and stuff like that with HBO max and, and Netflix and everything he took to his Twitter and, uh, and said that he was the original like creator of Kubo and the two strings yeah, and, and, creator and, and, yeah. and director and director. And he, he did the like early concept art, the storyboards basically. And he said, it's not even a, um, a like loose, uh, loose interpretation. No, that it was pretty much what ended up being the the finished product. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was in you know that was kind of sad. Uh, he says it's something not far at all from the film you saw in theaters. All seemed well, but it wasn't not at all. There were signs, things I should have seen, but I was in it and loving it. Long story short, after nearly two years of work, I was removed as director, removed from something that came so deep from my heart, and if and it nearly broke me. So yeah, that's a bummer. It's a bummer, and you know, uh, I'm not wanting to make light or not take this story seriously, but I, I. I think there's so much that we don't, you know, just as the, from like the movie going public that we don't know that goes on mm -hmm. in these studios. I wouldn't be surprised if this happens a lot. Like I remember, yeah. uh, I mean, some of the stuff is more public than others. Remember when Brenda Chapman got removed from Bray at mm -hmm. Pixar? Mm -hmm. And I was well, like bummed about that. And it's like, I was like, oh, yeah. they can, you know, that can never happen. At, you know, at Pixar, but, you know, it did. <laughs> yeah, and even and, more recently, you remember uh, when they first announced Raya with yeah. D23? It had, like, a whole different directing team. Different director different team, different, different lead, lead actress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for the voice cast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he does say, he says, I share this not from anger or spite. I'm still exceedingly thankful that something as personal as Kubo was released. And I still recognize him as the child I had imagined. That's a blessing. I share this as a story of hope. So he was trying to be kind of in his eyes, at least be encouraging to the people that were getting fired was kind of his, his idea. Yeah. And he, he, he 
it sounds like he left the project or he got fired from the project when they they still hadn't done any of the animation. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I cuz otherwise he could have I mean he could have like not sued them but under the director's guild. Like you can't the director's union, you can't just do that. If somebody actually directed the movie, they have to be given credit for yeah. it. They can't just be taken off like that. Yeah. Um and so he did he did get story credit uh on the He film. did. Yeah. Um uh, and uh, so there was that at least, but I'm sure that must have been difficult. Uh, and he says, don't let other people, corporations or setbacks get in the way of your stories. People want to hear them. They want to see them. We're the ones with the dreams that people want to experience. That is powerful. Know that, embrace it. And if you want to chat, I'm around. So that was sweet. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, Travis Knight, he's just directed two films. He directed this and he directed the Bumblebee film. Uh, which was far better than it had any right to be. Did you ever see that? I did see that. The bumble. Oh, you didn't and like it? It? Was like, it? It didn't suck. You know? okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, I thought it was sweet. I, I liked it. Yeah, it was, kind of a, I, a it was not kind a terrible film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it didn't suck. There we go. <laughs> The thing I like the most about this movie is that I think Kubo is such an endearing. Well, I love the animation, obviously, but Kubo is such an endearing character. He is so easy to root for, and you just feel for him immediately. The way mm-hmm. at the beginning, the way that he carefully makes the soup for his mom, and uh, and t- takes care of her, it's just so sweet. I agree. You know, totally agree. It's just instantly, yeah. You this. This is such, he's such a sympathetic character and, and mm-hmm. such a, yeah, he just, it's just a character you instantly just kind of love and, and you're rooting for. Yeah. Uh, and one of the cool things also about this movie is that it's the first animated film to ever be nominated for the Costume Designer Guild Award for Best, um, best Costumes. Uh, and, uh, they'd never done it for an animated film. And uh, I, I think that's kind of cool. You think the, the actual costumes that the puppets are wearing are very impressive. Yeah, they are. They're, they're amazing. And, and uh, it's again, uh, you know, it's deserved. It's, it's well-deserved and it's just so nice when I think in a way, you know, these people think outside the box a little bit to realize, or just to expand their, circle mm-hmm. <laughs> you know realize, yeah. yeah just because they're in making the, costumes for puppets they're still making costumes yeah i mean and whenever you have to make something smaller it's like way harder absolutely than making something big <laughs> and the level the, i just think the level of detail that they put mm-hmm. into the the costumes or i mean even just kubo's kind of little smock thing or whatever Mm -hmm. he's you know whatever the technical term is of what he's wearing and the way that everything the way that everything looks like paper is just and is paper it's so beautiful i love it i do too uh the designer is named deborah cook the the costume designer and uh, she says uh, in the uh, there's a variety article she says in early day in earlier days audiences for animation paid little attention to what characters wore however over the past two decades with technical advances in both cg and stop motion animation costumes and character design have developed as animation art forms much to the appreciation of view- viewers and uh, and it says costume construction used to be one of the last things to be considered in animation, says Cook, who previously designed costumes for Coraline and uh, Paranorman and the Box Trolls. And uh, to design the costumes in Kubo, she went to Japan to get a sense of how the modern population dresses, including what elements of cultural history are retained and adapted to the present. I collected fabrics from vintage clothing stores with authentic colors and surface work and threads and studied how they were constructed, says Cook, who originally took instruction in fine art and sculpture and learned upholstery techniques, metalworking, silicon casting, and mold making. Uh, So that's pretty cool. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we start out, we learn that the, the reason why his mother is an invalid basically uh, is because his grandfather stole uh, something from them and, and that her, his mother's kind of says that, that the mother's kind of in trauma, but one of the themes of the movie is about telling stories. And it says he, that Kubo tells paper stories with, with his origami. And uh, I, I, he's just so sincere. And, and I always respond to characters that are emotionally true. And I feel like Kubo is that way. Through and through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Travis Knight, he said that a particular influence came from the Yuki O woodblock style. And it says that the that the entire film was to look and feel as if it was a moving woodblock print. And of course you have one of the characters being a woodblock, the monkey. Yeah. But uh but I uh I thought that was you can really feel that inspiration, I think. Well, I think so too, Rachel, because one of the things that also really wowed me about Kubo is not only are the puppets, you know, again, beautifully made and beautifully clothed, you know, costume, the sets mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, are, are so striking in their, I think, how, sty how stylistic they are. Like even, you know, that that rock and kind of cave where Kubo and his mom are living at the, be at the beginning of the film. It's just so yeah. cool. So interesting looking, you know, and, and uh, I just feel like that continues, that continues throughout the film and, and uh, a whole nother level of craftsmanship. Cause I don't, I think that many of those sets are practical sets, you know, they're not just these CGI environments that, you know, they're, superimposing the puppet you know the puppet footage on and mm -hmm. uh and that's and that is interesting because i just you, in a way you feel like you are looking at painting or art or you know or something mm -hmm. yeah yeah it does have the backgrounds especially have that sort of white wash the um yes the like that ink style feel that you have in japanese in japan and the, just the way they use the paper and the way they use the water in that opening, that opening sequence with the water is just so stunning. Oh, it's amazing. Those waves. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so it goes to this bone festival, uh, which is this festival kind of like De, De, De Los Muertes, where they can commune and talk to speak to deceased loved ones. This is in Japan. And it, he, if he stays out after sunset, then the sisters will appear and uh, that they want him. They want to take him. And, uh, and so he stays out too late because he's praying to his father's lantern. And, uh, and then he wakes up in this land with the monkey and they have to find the armor uh, his father's uh, armor to protect him. And uh, says that monkey says that his mother is gone and the village is destroyed. Uh, and so they're on kind of, it starts sort of the quest part of the movie. And that's probably the weakness of the movie is sort of, they don't really, they have all of this beautiful world building and this lore, but a lot of it is just, they don't give them, I think quite enough interesting things to do. Yeah. Um, as far as the plot, I think it sometimes happens when you can feel that, oh, they were so focused on the lore. And, the, and this happens a lot with fantasy that they kind of forgot about the script a little bit. Yeah, I think kind of the second act for me really mm -hmm. <laughs> um, drags maybe is a little harsh, Rachel, but it, but it, it's definitely slows down. I think it loses momentum and then, mm -hmm. and then it gets pretty exciting again in the, in, in act three, but yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think you bring up a really good point that, that the world building became more important than, mm -hmm. you know, 
just like a good, just like storytelling that keeps the keeps things moving and the audience engaged. Yeah, and there was controversy about the vocal performances uh, that they didn't use uh, very many Asian actors. I think there's only two in small roles, and I think that that's something that that could be better. I don't, I don't deny that, but I also, I feel like the ones that they did pick aren't particularly inspired. Like I, 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 Charlize Theron and Matthew McConaughey, I just feel like are not great choices for these roles. You know, as you bring up a good point, I didn't, I liked Charlize, I think more than Matthew McConaughey's. It almost to me felt like, stunt casting you know like celebrity mm-hmm. casting like what yeah. do you got to you'll be voices in our film but mm-hmm. but uh and yeah maybe it would have been more appropriate particularly for today's sensibilities to have like if there if it had you know, been have michelle Japanese Yao. actors japanese yeah yeah i mean that's chinese i know but but if michelle Yao, that would have been way better way better way better yeah yeah yeah. Or like, yeah, or even like a Lucy Liu or, or somebody like that, I think. Mm-hmm. Just to give a little more flair. It's just kind of flat, the the vocal performances uh, on those characters. But the, uh, the any time that, that they ever talk about uh, Kubo and his eye and whether they're going to take away his eye or they wanted his eye. I feel like you see this look of like absolute hurt on Kubo's face. And it gets me every time he talks, you can take away my other eye. Like yeah. it was just, I thought that really worked. Well, you know, one of the things too, you know, t- talking about the puppets for, that I'm with you. Uh, Kubo was so expressive. I yeah. thought the work they did on, on his mother was remarkable mm-hmm. that, when when she'd go into those moments of kind of being vague you know and, and not mm-hmm. knowing you know not, not knowing who she is or where she or you know or where she is the way that they make that vacant look on her face was so impressive to me because i'm thinking this is a puppet you know that mm-hmm. they are pulling that kind of emotion out of really s- stunning yeah and I, I do love the um, character design on the monkey. The the way they do the fur and everything is I absolutely do. Yeah, it's really beautiful. cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then they 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 meet this. They meet the beetle. He comes. He's an amnesiac samurai who was cursed to take the form of a beetle. Kind of hybrid character. And yeah, he's just kind of there. Is not particularly memorable. The beetle. Yeah, but he, you know, he get along I, with the I monkey. like it that it's his it's his dad ultimately. You mm-hmm. know that we find out. But I'm with you. I I, I, I don't know. I wish it could have been more inspiring <laughs> earlier on. Maybe we'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable, hardy, or hallmarky in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies merch store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. So... Then they they continue on their journey and they have this whole sequence where they eat salmon. I think it's salmon or some kind of fish, red, yeah. you know, red fish. And I think that salmon looks so good, even though it's raw. <laughs> it looks so good. They made it look so appealing. Yeah. <laughs> Just another tribute to those great artists at Leica. Hmm. 
And uh, there's a line where they uh, they say, where Kobu says, I've never had a meal sitting between anyone before. Yeah. It's always been alone. And I thought that was a, kind of a sweet moment. Uh, character. I always relate to the lonely characters and stories. <laughs> I always find this endearing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the so the monkey explains that she and her sisters were ordered by the Moon King to kill Hanzu. That's the dad. And uh, so they uh, then Kubo has this dream of the of his father's fortress that's completely made. Everything's made of paper. Yeah. And that's a beautiful sequence. Gorgeous. Stunning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he dreams of meeting the blind elderly man who points him towards the helmet invulnerable in Hanzo's abandoned fortress. And, uh, and then you have this whole sequence where Kubo fights the sisters, the sword fighting and everything. And that's another great sequence. The action is great in this movie. It is unparalleled. The action is something else. And those sisters, I mean, talk about terrifying. Yeah, they really are. And, you know, again, it's Rooney Mara who's, who's voicing who's voicing them, who I think does a fine job. But again, there's probably criticism, right? Since, since mm-hmm. she's vo- voicing um, these, Asian, these yeah. Asian characters. But wow, she's the animation the- of them is stunning. And they, oh. are, they are scary. Yeah, they really are. And we find out that the beetle is Hanzu, is the dad, like you said. Uh, and they've cursed they for they cursed him. Uh, and uh, then they kill they've killed Hanzu and uh, so he says, You are my quest, you always have been. That was sweet. Yeah. And then the monkey sacrifices herself. And so Kubo has time to use his, it's called a shamisen is his instrument. And he has the, he has, he has the string from his mom's hair. He has the string from his hair and the string from, is it the monkey? Well, the other just the string. Is that it? Is that just the two strings? Yeah, you know, the string. That's the thing. Yeah. Is it from the monkey oh. or is it from like it's, the original guitar? It's a. Uh, so he or, has his mother's hair, his father's bow string, and his own hair. Okay. Yeah, I wrote that. I did write that down. So okay. it's in the shamisen. Yeah. And so then Kubo confronts his grandfather with the armor. And uh, he says, you want to take my other eye. You're old and mean and cruel. And storytelling is a sort of a theme throughout the movie. Yes. And the grandfather said, when you are up there with me, you will be beyond stories. And, and then he says, all, then Kuba says, all stories have an end. Uh, And I, I, I think that that is, a beautiful theme of the movie is the power of stories and the power of endings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, when he tries to take his eye, there's something about that. That's just so brutal. I think. Oh, it's horrible. I mean, talk about you you instantly hate the grandfather, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) knowing that he did that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so then the uh, the Moon King transforms into a giant dunkless lotus. It's like a dragon, basically. And uh, and then you get just incredible action scene of him fighting the fighting the Moon Beast and the um, the remaining villagers are at the cemetery and. And when he has the f- complete, sh- complete shamashen, he's able to play and defeat the moon beast. Yeah. My, my memories are the most powerful kind of magic there is. That's such a beautiful scene. Cause I feel mm-hmm. like to using their wonderful visual effects. Cause I don't know how many of those when, 
I'm calling I'll call my ancestors. You know, when the ancestors mm-hmm. all start yeah. appearing. And if that's if that's a combination of of you know puppets, practical puppets, and then CG to to enhance the you know the lighting and and the effects were anyway. It's 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 mm-hmm. very moving and and just stunning. You know, yeah, vis- visually stunning. How do you feel about the ending where they kind of give the grandfather an out? He's done these horrible things. He's killed Hanzo. He's put a curse on. And he basically killed his mother as well. It made her, you know, this vegetable kind of. She's he's done all these bad things. But they have him come back and he has amnesia. And uh, and so the villagers are able to kind of retrain his brain and remind him of good things and make him good. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, I thought it was a compassionate ending, but not particularly satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to describe it. I wanted it. I that agree. sucker to go down. Because <laughs> he's so evil. Yeah. But but yeah, I thought that they for whatever reason, you know, they decided to go for this this compassion compassionate route and mm-hmm. you know is yeah. So that's what, how did you yeah. feel about it? I no, I completely agree. I agree. It is does feel kind of not as satisfying as you want. You kind of want him to like fall into a pit of lava, or, you know what I mean? Like Exactly. <laughs> explode you want him to have like an ending like maleficent you know yes <laughs> the end of sleeping beauty or uh, one of these kinds of things because he's been so bad and been so mean and he wants to take kubo's eye kubo's out and- eye he took one of them out and lost <laughs> the other yeah so i don't i don't know if i if it, it's it's I see what they were doing and it's sweet, but I probably would have done something else. I would have yeah. done something else at the end. You know, but, I thought, you know, again, maybe celebrity casting, but Ray Fiennes was very good. I mean, you know, we know that he plays yeah. a great bad guy. It's true. And, and, and he was, he, he was very good, but again, not, you know, he's not Asian, uh, mm-hmm. but still, so he gave a good performance. I thought, yeah. He yeah, yeah, I agree. He's probably, yeah, he's one of the better, better yes. vocal performances of the movie. Art Parkinson is the Kubo voice, and I think he does a good job as well. Yep, I think he's and, very good. Uh, yeah, so overall, I think it held up quite well. We haven't talked really about the giant skeleton puppet. Unbelievable. 16 it's, feet high it's bonkers and they show during you know the end credits a little bit of how they constructed it or filming that and it's yeah it's mm-hmm. that's something really cool yeah and i guess there is a classic japanese story called takayasha the witch and the skeleton specter oh uh, it was inspired this this giant this, skeleton. Yeah. It's um 16 feet high, 400 pound puppet. Uh, it's the record holder for largest stop motion puppet. Uh, and it is unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, Rach, speaking of endings, what did you think about the resolution? I guess what we call a resolution between Kubo and his mom and dad. How that, how that gets handled what, what, what was your what was your take on that yeah i so he he talks to their ghosts right yeah yeah in the in the future it's kind of similar to like in coco with a the with the future day of the dead you know yeah. ceremonies and kind of similar to that <clears throat> so yeah i thought it was okay what did you think you know, again, I was thinking if somehow they could magically make the grandfather, you know, <laughs> yeah. kind of get normalized and be forgetful. It's like, can they resurrect? I mean, I, you know, this is, I'm just being irrational, but it's like, can we resurrect <laughs> I mean, the mom and dad? Story. I mean, yeah, it would have been nice if, uh, if there had been a way for, if they're going to kind of 
if they're going to resurrect the uh, the grandfather in a way and give him this new life, it would have been nice to have had the same thing for his mom. But particularly, I, especially yeah, the mom. especially the mom. However, though, I thought artistically that was more more satisfying in that you know here Kubo is just praying. Yeah. And just saying, I need my mom and dad. You know, I still need I still need you both. And and that however that's gonna work, you know, you just feel like, okay, they're present mm-hmm. and they're gonna be watching, you know, that they're gonna be they're gonna be together, although it's gonna be different. And I, I but I did yeah. I, visually though, I thought again it was beautiful because the way that they gave them kind of that gold hue, you know. As, as 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 was going on with the ancestors, so I wasn't as kind of unsatisfied with that as I was with with the grandfather. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But and also I think too, and I think it resonates with you know our mutual faith in that mm-hmm. there is this there is this connection with a familiar there's this familiar connection that that you know, go, goes on through time, you know, through Mm -hmm. past death that resonated with me, you know, that seemed to be speaking truth to how how I, Mm -hmm. how I see how that works. So that, you know, this connection between the parent and their child and their child and this family Mm-hmm. you know is it's true and also it's comforting because kubo has been such a lonely character oh. to know that he's not going to that there there's some comfort in that, that yeah he's alone yeah mm-hmm. so that's that's true that's that's very true so there we go i i think it's it is a movie that still holds up it's a beautiful film i yeah. i asked my friends on twitter what they thought of it and I got some responses. A lot of people were like, oh, I haven't seen it in a while. I haven't watched it. I, I, Chris White says, I liked it when I saw it in theaters. Haven't seen it since. Our friend Jonathan, he says it holds up pretty well. Kevin the Critic, he says, I need to see it under better circumstances. On my first viewing, an audience member was talking constantly, so I couldn't uh, pay attention to what was happening. Annoying. That just happened to me at at the screening of the new uh, horror movie barbarian, which was like out of my comfort zone to see, but I at least wanted to have like a a good experience. And this lady, she was commenting next to me. She was commenting on everything loudly. Oh, she should have gone there, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, ah, stop talking. Yes. I was like, she's the true villain of the film. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Jacob Dominguez says I really like Kubo and the Two Strings gorgeous animation, great adventure I watched it again a while back and I think it holds up really well uh, Isaiah Washington says probably one of the best anime films of the 2010s an exceptional feat of VFX animation and production design uh, and Mike K says haven't seen it since theaters but I remember loving it it's a very strong directorial debut for Travis Knight Lasse Voigt, he says, it's visually stunning and the score is amazing, but it gets caught up too much in its own mythology and misses a certain amount of emotion and heart. Also not fan of the casting. Uh, Jacob Martin says, it's my favorite film from Laika and one of the most epic and emotional roller coasters in the art form of animation. And... Uh, and Tristan, he says, uh, Michael Tristan says, while I still think it's animation and action scenes are as good as it gets and its characters are also great and really well written. I do think it's story looking back could have been a bit better and knowing what happened during production makes things worse. They keep going. Um, Ralph Hansen says, I thought the storytelling, great storytelling and phenomenal animation. I also love Regina Spector covering while my guitar gently weeps. Yeah, I love that too. We talk about that. Yeah, I love that. That's really cool. In retrospect, an Asian story should have had more Asian voice actors. Yeah, we agree with that. Uh, Let's see. I got a ton. Uh, There's still Christian Pacer. He's the one who told me about the whole controversy. He says, still really solid, but the revelation of Shannon Tindall getting 
uh, direct directing credit uh, taken away. So Travis Knight can boost himself has made me not interested in revisiting it for a while. So that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, there's tons here. So thank you so much for everybody's comments. And uh, this was a fun one to, to talk about and revisit. I'm glad uh, I'm glad I randomly thought of it. <laughs> Me too. Thank you, Rachel. And yeah, yeah I, no. I really, I really enjoyed the rewatch. So yeah. And, and, and fun, to, fun to discuss. Thanks so much. Yeah. So let us know if you're listening, what you think of Kubo and the two strings. How does it hold up for you? We'd love to hear in the comment section or on Twitter and Stanford, where can people find you on Twitter? I'm at Stanford Clark and I have a movie podcast and blog at movies past and present.com. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. So check that out. Also, if you are listening to the podcast on iTunes, please leave your ratings and reviews. We really appreciate that so much. And if you are listening on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that so much. We also have the patron group and merch store where you can get hashtag animation junkie shirts. So check that out. And uh, thanks so much again. We'll talk to y'all later. Bye. Bye.